Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inuser Education. Um, I would like to solve a couple of problems related to Lorentz force. Um, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com. There is, by the way, um, a prerequisite course called Math for Teens. Physics is using lots of lots of math, so you really have to know math. So if you need Math for Teens, is for you as well. Um, now, I would recommend you to watch this lecture from this website rather than from, let's say, YouTube or wherever you found it, um, because the site contains very detailed notes for each lecture. It's like a textbook, basically. Um, plus, if you would like to uh, register, you can um, save some information about your exams. Um, maybe your parents or teachers can actually get involved in uh, your education, basically assign assigning you certain things, certain topics from the course, etc. But it's not necessary. You can go to the website. It's completely free. There are no ads. You don't have to sign in. And there are even exams if you want to take it. So, we have three problems related to the Lorentz force. So, the problem number one is the following. Consider there is a um, uniform magnetic field. So, this is north and south of some kind of a magnet which is around it. But in between these two, it's a uniform. For instance, it's, it can be, you know, the shoe, uh, the horseshoe kind of a magnet. This is the north, this is the south. And this is the lines of the field, uh, which are, we can assume it's uniform. Or any other way of creating the uniform um, magnetic field. Now, there is some kind of a uh, wire here hanging um, on two threads, let's say. Um, now, this is, I, I, I tried to, um, to picture it in, in three dimensions, but basically for my purpose it's um, much more important uh, to show it in such a way that the wire is like this pen, basically, this way. To show how it behaves in the magnetic field. So, this is my wire. It goes through this board, perpendicular to the board. These are magnetic fields, field lines, okay? So, what happens if there is an electric current going through this um, particular wire. Well, um, we have the Lorentz force, right? So there is a Lorentz force and uh, it forces the, uh, the whole wire to basically move perpendicularly to both um, direction of the magnetic force and direction of the current, right? So, let's assume that it goes this way. Now, but since it's hanging, so these are the hanging needs, it will basically take this position. So, from this position, it will go to this position. It has certain mass, the wire has certain mass, so there is a gravity, we are assuming this is in a gravitational field of Earth, so there is some kind of an acceleration of the free fall, so it cannot really go all the way up, because even if the, even if the magnet is large enough, let's consider it's still within the field, but it will still not go all the way up. Well, it depends, obviously, how strong the field is, but it will go a little bit up, and then the force of the gravity will push it back here, right? So we have two different forces. The Lorentz force, which goes always 
in this particular direction. And we have a here, we have a gravity. Here. This is gravity, and this is the Lorentz force. And obviously there is a tension of the wire. Now, at a certain moment, uh, it will stop because these three forces will balance each other. And, and now here is the problem. <laughs> so there is a mass, there is a G, there is an angle phi uh, at which it actually stopped and it reaches the equilibrium. These three forces are in equilibrium. Now, what else? Now, this particular wire has certain lengths and there is a current which goes through it. Now, in my problem, I don't really have the current, but I have the voltage and the resistance of the wire. So, this um, this wire is connected to certain source of electricity which has the voltage and the wire has certain resistance R. So these are all given. Now what remains to be determined is what is the force of the magnetic field. Remember Tesla? These are units we are measuring the intensity of the magnetic field, right? So that's what we have to find out. We have to measure intensity of the field. Now, obviously, we will use the Lorentz force, which basically states that this Lorentz force is equal to um, the current times length of the wire times the intensity of the magnetic force. So we were measuring the force, the current, and the lengths, and we have determined that the force is proportional to these two things. And this is basically a coefficient of proportionality, which depends on the field. Obviously, the stronger the field, magnetic field, the greater will be the force with given current and, and the lengths. So this equation can be a measurement if we know the force, it can be a measurement of um, the magnetic field's intensity. And that's exactly what we would like to find out here. We don't have the force, however, we know that these three forces, T, F, and this is Mg. I think I use capital M in my problem. P is equal to Mg. So the, we know that these three forces are proportion, uh, are in equivalent, in equilibrium <laughs> to each other. So that gives us the force. We can determine the force, and from the force we will determine the um, the magnetic field's uh, intensity. Okay. So let's do first the mechanical part to find the force, and then we will do the electromagnetic part. From the force we will find the intensity of the field. So, let me just take this down. This used to be M. So, this is our wire and this is the angle it actually moves from the vertical direction under the influence of the Lorentz force. So this is the Lorentz force F. Now this is the weight Mg and this is the tension. Now, and we know the angle uh, phi, alright? And we know the mass obviously. Well, but that's what the force, the, the, the weight actually is. Okay, so how can we basically make all these um, in equivalent? <coughs> well, 
Das ist grau. So if this is T, then to the left, this is phi, goes uh, T times T times sine of phi. This is T times sine of phi. And this is T times cosine of phi. Now, if this thing is in balance, in equilibrium, the T sine phi is uh, nullifying the F, and T cosine is nullifying the weight P, right? So these two are equal, and these two are equal in absolute value, and obviously the direction is opposite, and that's why we have complete equilibrium. Well, that's basically enough to find the force. Here it is. So first, T is equal to uh, mg divided by cosine phi, and if we will multiply it by sine, it will be the force phi, the force, the Lorentz force f. We're talking about absolute value, right? So, don't uh, uh, let's not use the vectors here. I mean, we know about the vectors. Vectors are opposite, so we're talking about absolute value. All right. So this is the value of the f, the Lorentz force. Now, from this, we can find the intensity of the magnetic field, right? So v is equal to f divided by i l. Now we can obviously use the law that i, the current, is equal to um, voltage divided by resistance, the Ohm's law, right? So it's the voltage, the resistance goes here way, and this is l. So, from this, we can find the B is equal to, instead of F, we put this. Now, by the way, this is tangent phi. Hope you remember the trigonometry. So, it's uh, mg tangent phi. Uh, this is F. So times R and divided by U L. So all these variables are used in this formula. And this is the intensity of the field. Now let's just think about it. I mean how logical and reasonable the formula actually is. Obviously, if given the angle, the more massive our wire is the more force we need to, more Lorentz force, which means the more intensity of the field we need to move this mass to this angle, right? Similarly, if angle is given, if it's not on Earth, but on the Jupiter, for instance, the weight is greater than the same mass, right? So G would not be 9.8 meters per second square, but something else. So obviously, on the Jupiter it requires more because the weight is more so the force should be stronger, the Lorentz force should be stronger and the field should have more intensity. Now, resistance. If resistance is greater then the current is less, right? And obviously the less the current the less influence the um, magnetic field has on the wire. I mean, if there is no current at all there is no Lorentz force. So basically, it should depend uh, on, uh, on the resistance. The greater the resistance, the more field we need to compensate for the weakness of the current. Now, here, in the denominator, we have um, the voltage. Again, the greater the voltage was given other parameters, the stronger the current. 
and the stronger the current, the less uh, magnetic force we need because the interaction depends on both magnetic force and the current. They are, you see, proportional to each other. So if this is greater, this can be smaller to compensate. <coughs> and same thing for the lengths. I mean, the longer the lengths, the more interaction with magnetic uh, field this wire has. Obviously, it's easier. So the greater this, the less this should be. Okay, that's basically the kind of explanation of this formula that really is reasonable. Oh yes, I forgot about tangent. Now, if the greater the greater the, the angle is, obviously the stronger the field should be, right? And the tangent E is monotonically increasing um, function. Well, in this case, from 0 to 90 degrees range. Okay, that's it for the first problem. Now, the second problem is um, related to um, something the physicists really like to work with. Uh, now, uh, right now, or probably during the last 50 years, lots of physicists were involved in elementary particles, which they were um, using to uh, uh, using some kind of a, uh, accelerators uh, they are bombarding certain other elements with elementary particles etc so this is about elementary particles now i will simplify this and then i will explain actually what kind of a relationship it has to elementary particles now consider you have a wire and there is no current yet, but there is one specific point charge, Q, which is traveling through the wire uh, with uh, the speed V. Now let's consider that the wire has certain lengths and the field, magnetic field, has certain intensity B given. Now, my first question is not related to magnetism, it's related to electricity. If one particular charge going like a point charge, like an impulse, if you wish, what is an impulse? Impulse is actually a, a, a point charge moving along the wire, right? So if this particular charge is moving along the wire, can we talk about equivalent uh, direct current which basically delivers the same thing, the same result? Now, what is the same result? Certain amount of electricity which is moving during certain amount of time, right? What is the definition of the current? It's num uh, amount, uh, amount of electricity in coulombs, let's say, divided by time t per unit of time, right? That's what basically uh, what the definition of the current is. Now, can we talk about equivalent current here? Well, yes, because the time we have, this is L divided by V, distance divided by the speed. Now, the amount of electricity is Q. So when this particular point charge moves along the wire all the way, that's equivalent to I equals to Q divided by time, which is L times V. So this is the current which is produced by one single um, charge moving along a wire, point charge, just by, by itself. It's not exactly the same as direct current, because direct current means a flow 
of electrons, not just an impulse. However, from the perspective um, of, uh, you know, practical kind of view to this particular um, um, experiment, it looks like we have the current of this kind. Because, again, we are moving certain amount of electricity during certain amount of time. So, we can assume, and I definitely recognize that it's not mathematically rigorous assumption, we can assume that instead of one charge, point charge, going through the wire under this condition with the speed and, and the length of the wire, um, we have a current which is physically equivalent. So we should observe the same kind of results of this experiment as if the current of this kind flowing through the wire. Okay? Again, it's not mathematically rigorous, but on the physical level of observing the same results, that's actually true. So, what is our problem now? So the first problem was determine the equivalent direct current equivalent to this particular situation. And the second problem is to define to find out what is the Lorentz force exerted exerted on um, on this wire. Well, that's simple. F is equal to I times L times B, right? Which is equal to L will cancel, so we will have Q V B. So if one particular let's say electron or proton, some electric particle, electrically charged particle, going through the magnetic field, forget about the wire now, L is it's cancelled out. It experiences the Lorentz force, it, it feels this Lorentz force equal to this. It depends on the charge, on the speed, and, up <coughs> and obviously on the field itself. Wire is no longer involved. Why? Well, <coughs> because this Lorentz force, where is it applicable? If it's a point charge, it's applicable only to this local place where this particular charge loca is located at, at one particular moment. So at every moment, the whole force of this magnitude is acting on this charge only, not on the entire wire. So that's what kind of a little deviation I would say from from the classical <coughs> excuse me, from the classical view on the Lorentz force we don't have this wire with a direct current flowing constantly flowing with a, with the same speed through it we have one particular particle carrying a charge and now this force actually acts on this particular particle so, this is the answer to the second problem. This is the Lorentz force which we wanted to find out. This is the force which the particle actually is acted upon. And this is the second problem. Now, the third problem is related to the second problem, and I will explain you how. Now, Let's forget about the wire. We do have a particle and it just flows through the magnetic field. So that's the equivalent of the current going that way and magnetic field going this way. So in this particular case this particle should deviate from its uh, straight line trajectory because there is a Lorentz force and it's perpendicular to the trajectory and perpendicular to this. So it goes to perpendicular to the board. Now I will change my view. I will look from the top and what do I see in this particular case? The lines of magnetic fields are 
dots in this particular case. They go vertically. So all the magnetic field lines. So let's assume that the north is here and the south is behind the board. Okay, now, what if I have a particle which is flowing into this magnetic field? Now we are assuming, obviously, that the magnetic field is uniform and it has uh, the intensity B in Teslas, okay? So what happens? Well, depending on the direction of the magnetic lines, north to south or south to north, let's not think about this right now. Let's consider what will be with the force, uh, with the Lorentz force. Lorentz force will be perpendicular to both. To these lines, magnetic lines from north to south, and to the current. Well, the particle uh, goes, so this is an elect electrically charged particle, it's a Q, would definitely be, and this is the speed, will definitely be equivalent to a current. And the force will be perpendicular to both, perpendicular to this and perpendicular to this, which is what? Well, it's a vertical direction. So let's assume it's down. So if it's down, then it should curve, right? The force goes down. It's perpendicular to this and perpendicular to lines of magnetic field. Now let's just think about it. The force is always perpendicular to the trajectory, which means that at this point the force is this way. At this point the force is this way. Then it goes a little further and the force will be still perpendicular. So it looks like, well, if fields is everywhere, magnetic field, it looks like it should actually turn into a circle. Well, let's just think about, is it a circle? Now, and this is a difficult part because I cannot rigorously prove that this is a circle because it's kind of involved. Uh, there are lots of, you know, calculations and there are some very elegant solutions, but it's a little bit beyond the level of mathematics which, uh, which, which I'm presenting in this course. But let me just explain why it should be a circle. Well, first of all, um, the force, the Lorentz force, is always perpendicular to trajectory. What does it mean? It means that there is no linear acceleration. You see, wherever it goes, if the force is always perpendicular, it does not increase the tangential speed. So there is no linear acceleration. At the same time, the force has always the same value, right? The Lorentz force is equal to what? Q, V, and V, right? From the previous problem, problem number two. So Q is the same, V is a linear speed of this particular charge, and the V is the field, which is uniform. So we always have exactly the same value of force. Direction is always changing perpendicular to trajectory. But the value is the same. So, what does it mean? Well, considering we have a mass, which is always the same, so we have a force, we have a mass, so there is a um, second Newton's law, right? Which gives me an acceleration perpendicularly to the trajectory. Do you remember the rotation. The kinematics of rotation is that there is always centripetal acceleration A, which is equal to what? R uh, omega square or R or V square divided by R. Omega is angular speed and V is linear speed, the same as this one. So we will use this particular thing. So, is A is a centripetal acceleration always towards the center and always perpendicular 
to the trajectory, right? Exactly the same as in our case. The force is perpendicular, the Lorentz force is perpendicular to the trajectory, right? And, uh, and it's constant uh, value, constant absolute value. So it really looks like this um, circular movement satisfies completely our conditions. Now, from the physical standpoint, it's usually sufficient to say, okay, that's why the trajectory is a circle. Um, as a mathematician, I would say that's not exactly a rigorous proof because maybe there is some kind of other curve in um, on the plane which also has the same properties that the speed would be um, linear speed would be constant and uh, acceleration uh, perpendicular to the linear speed uh, would also be constant but not a circle well and this is exactly what the difficult part to prove that there is no such curve is not easy so just take my word um, and there are actually a couple of websites which maybe I will put into the notes for this lecture that basically goes to a rigorous proof that the, the, the circle is the only thing which is possible so we assume that circle is the trajectory so trajectory, circle trajectory definitely satisfies all our parameters now what is my question? my question is what is the radius of this? given whatever else parameters we need well the radius we can define from here right r is equal to v squared divided by a we know v okay a well a is f divided by m that's the second newton's law and f we also have so what do we have we have r is equal to v squared divided by f which is q v b and m goes to the top uh, b m goes to the top which is equal to mv divided by q b mv is by the way momentum of motion so the greater the momentum of motion, the greater the radius will be. So either the mass is very big or the speed is very big. And to turn it needs obviously greater radius. It will go more, a greater radius if it's stronger momentum. Now if charge is greater or uh, intensity of the field is greater, the force will be greater which actually rounds up the trajectory so that's basically the kind of reasonable formula and that's how um, they calculate what exactly kind of accelerator we need if we would like to let's say um, accelerate one particular proton for instance so we know the Q uh, the charge of the proton, we know the mass of the proton um, and depending on what kind of a uh, speed we need uh, and what kind of a intensity of the magnetic field we can do this will give us the radius and uh, the radius can be very big I mean there are some accelerators which have you know, miles in, in, in the diameter, right? so that gives you the radius how to build an accelerator, a cyclotron, all right? Okay, that's it for today. I do recommend you to read my notes for this lecture. Good luck. Thank you.